to those of you on live, welcome. And of course, those of you that'll watch this as a recording, also welcome. And uh, I'm Mike Nash. I'm our VP of Information and Cloud Security at Lightbend. And I'm going to talk a little bit today about uh, cloud security and how you can write and develop and deploy um, secure web applications or any other kind of application using our product Calyx. And uh, Hugh McKee, our developer advocate, is with me today. <clears throat> He'll jump in if my uh, slightly less than normal internet gives us any trouble. Please feel free to add questions in there. There's a Q&A tab now in Zoom because we're in webinar mode. So feel free to add questions in there and we'll try to address them either during the presentation or definitely at the end. I'm just pausing for a moment to let anyone else that's going to join jump in. All righty, without further ado, let's dive in here. I'm going to share my screen. And have a quick run through a deck that I've prepared to, uh, to give us some talking points. I, I may go a little off script just as there are things that are always changing, of course, <clears throat> but uh, welcome again. And welcome to this presentation about uh, information security and privacy with Calyx. So the things we're gonna talk about today are building secure applications with Calyx. Calyx is of course a hosted service by Lightband. So security is a, a big deal to us and a very important priority. How Calyx is built and our own internal InfoSec program will cover. How you architecture and develop your application to take advantage of security features will cover. And how your Calyx environment and its services should be configured to work best in a secure environment will be covered. We'll also talk a little bit about compliance and how your company's compliance can make use of what we do with Calyx. Okay, so let's quickly talk about Lightbend's information security program, um, a topic near and dear to my heart, and also sort of the foundation of how we build and run Calyx in a secure way. <clears throat> so, we have an information security program, of course, at Lightbend, and Calyx is built within an environment that is designed to promote security from the ground up. So from the beginning of how people are vetted to make sure that they should be a part of the team, to how our development environments are created, uh, to all of the uh, dependencies of Calyx, these are all part and parcel of our InfoSec uh, program. And these are all about both how Calyx is built and how it's operated. And we have an extensive set of policies that make sure that we're all on the same page internally as to how these things should be done, where the boundaries are, what tools should be used, and so forth. So our policies not only count against how Calyx is built, as I mentioned, but also how it's operated. Although it is zero op ops from the customer's point of view, you don't have to worry about operations or Kubernetes or any of these things for Calyx. Um, it obviously isn't for us. We're the ones who are actually operating it. And our team follow a series of very secure practices to allow us to be able to guarantee your data security, integrity, and availability. So it's not just a matter of security, but of course you must be able to get to your data. <clears throat> our information security program is built around a series of policies that start from the uh, AICPA SOC 2 standards, security and organization control standards, I believe is what that stands for. So our software development and our operations are guided by these policies and our team are continually trained in the latest standards and techniques for building secure systems. In fact, that's one of our policies is that our team is always up to date on what the latest and greatest discoveries are in the world of information security. And then what we have is this is our compliance and our attestation that we follow these policies. We also have an external annual audit and we're in the middle of setting up the very first one of those that confirms our opinion that we are following these standards. So we have an, an independent firm <clears throat> that validates and gives you the SOC 2 certification, which basically says we've looked and we attest that Lightband is in fact following these practices uh, during the period that we've observed. And that observation period is over uh, a period of three months. And we do that every year. So not only are we meeting these standards at a point in time, we're meeting them on an ongoing basis. So the software development is where it begins essentially with Calyx and how Calyx can be used in your environments to build secure applications. 
our software development environment begins with, of course, our people. And we've talked about how they're uh, validated via background checks and so on, and then exposed to ongoing training so that they always have the opportunity to learn what are the, the vectors that we should be concerned about from an operations point of view, and also how should we build Calyx to allow you to build applications that can remain secure operationally. <clears throat> now, of course, software supply chain is a big deal nowadays, and everything we use to build Calyx is uh, validated and scanned. Now, one of the core elements of Calyx is, of course, our ACA, or App ACA framework, which like Bend also build. But then ACA has dependencies. And then, of course, some of those dependencies have de dependencies all the way down. We validate that entire supply chain, both with uh, manual scans periodically so that we can investigate the complexities of that chain, but also with automated scanning. So if any new dependency is added before it's actually built into any of our products, there is an automated system that is part of the CICD process for us that verifies that there are no known vulnerabilities, there are no security warnings about adding that new package. And then that's validated by a human whenever a new change is made. So our change control process also allows us to make sure that multiple eyes are on every change that could have any bearing at all on the security uh, of Kilix itself and therefore your data. <clears throat> so any vulnerabilities that are discovered, any CVEs that are reported, of course, by our system are immediately addressed before a new release. And any CVEs that are discovered after release are also immediately addressed. So let's say a discovery of a CVE in a library that we thought was secure is made after a release of Calyx. That, of course, becomes a very high priority for us. And our customers are automatically notified to say, hey, this has been discovered after release. Here's what we're doing about it. Here's how you can avoid you know, any harm from this potential vulnerability. So our process, of course, is very secure. So we develop and store our code on secure systems, of course, uh, with all of the various state-of-the-art protections that you could imagine. Uh, we report and investigate all security incidents transparently. So our customers know exactly what we've done, how we're going to make sure that problem didn't occur again. Uh, honestly, not many do occur, but every now and then we'll find a warning coming through from one of our providers that we have to investigate. We make sure that your, your team is very informed of that. And of course, Calyx's own source code is scanned with tools that we helped build. Uh, so there's actually a tool called Fortify, and we built a plugin for the language Scala that we build Calyx with. <clears throat> and it allows us to find patterns that are potential security holes and to address them. And address them might mean in this situation, that's perfectly safe, or no, we should actually change that practice and do something else with our source code. And then of course, every change is reviewed by two of our team. Uh, so that it's not possible for one person to make a mistake and no one else to see it before it makes its way into the uh, into the product. So on top of our development process, when we deploy, we deploy onto the major cloud providers. We're working right now on Azure. We have already deployed onto uh, Google Cloud and to AWS. And we, of course, take full advantage of the fact that they have very robust security programs. So we're standing on the shoulders of giants, so to speak, to say, all right, we will utilize all of the security mechanisms, encrypted disk, physical security, all of the things that these providers uh, give to us, we will make full use of as we build Calyx and put the little piece on top that we do that's Calyx that allows you to utilize our service. Uh, the links you see in this presentation are actually the links to the uh, pro cloud provider's own InfoSec process. And you can learn about how deep and wide, and of course they are, as you can imagine, quite extensive um, from each of the cloud providers. So another element of InfoSec is that is very important in a highly international environment, which is what we deploy to, is data sovereignty. Where is your data physically? Um, and in what domain does it reside and therefore what legal protections does it have what legal framework is it under so with a what we call a calyx dedicated instance which is a specific cluster set up for your use as a customer as opposed to a multi-tenant cluster which is used by many customers uh, calyx allows us in this modality when we're doing a dedicated cluster to specify which region you'd like to run in so if you specifically need to run in the EU, we can run in the Frankfurt data center, in the, you know, the Stockholm data center, wherever you need. We currently have dedicated Calyx instances running in many of them in the United States, some in Europe, and so far one in Australia. <clears throat> so the data and all of its processing occur only within that region. So not only within the sovereignty, but within that specific region. 
across multiple zones, though, of course, for availability, but within a specific region. So data sovereignty is a big thing for us. Now, assurance and compliance, many companies, virtually all companies that are out there selling services on the web nowadays, have their own compliance program and standards that they must comply with. And Calix being a vendor to them means that we must, in fact, ad adhere to a certain level of compliance in order for your program to be complete. So we adhere to the standards for secure development, again, by adhering to the SOC 2 standard. There's actually several others. The uh, There's a uh, the GDPR standard, for example, <clears throat> and uh, we also implement some of the ISO 27001 controls. <clears throat> Excuse me. That also involves a lot of the things I've already talked about. So extensive review of any security related change. There's always review of every change, but there is more extensive review and more extensive testing, of course, of anything that may actually affect uh, security, credentials, anything of that nature, a new login mechanism and so forth. Extensive testing at many layers. So the testing is not isolated to any one level of testing. Uh, the whole system is tested on a completely separate development environment, that it's performance tested on a staging environment to make sure availability isn't impacted. And all of this is an automated process that happens before the new version of Calix even runs to production. Um, and of course, only as needed access control to all admin functions on our side. So our team is, you know, unless there is a necessity or a request, we are not actually accessing the running Calix instances at all. We're managing the cluster externally, but not dealing with your data. Um, and of course, automated validation of deployment signatures to make sure that the image that we're deploying is in fact the image that is getting deployed. And then on top of that, of course, uh, extensive automated observability. So we have monitoring, we have tools like Grafana Cloud and so on that allow us to keep an eye on the operational cluster and then some security specific tools that will alert us to anything that's out of band. So performance is impacted or a potential DDoS attack, all of these trigger an alert process on our end and our incident management process, which we'll talk about later. So how do you develop securely with Calix? Because of course the nature of the platform is we're running a platform, but your teams are building the code and deploying to that platform. So you must of course make sure that access to those applications that you've deployed is secure. And Calix provides a number of facilities directly for you to do that. So a very quick and, and hand wavy level uh, architecture diagram of Calix talks about its data stores, talks about a client application and, and a quick assortment of some of the mechanisms. These are always being extended. We just actually added a new one recently for multi-factor authentication. <clears throat> but to give you an idea what the mechanisms are that are provided that your application can take advantage of. So typically there's some manner of client application, either another service or perhaps a web-based application that is communicating over an HTTPS or some you know, similar link to a network routing. As soon as it touches the Calyx network, the beginnings of security start there. So for example, only selected ports are available. You have some options to enable other ports, but by default, there is not even a, an external web route to the service that you deploy on Calyx. For example, it may be only used by other services within your application, in which case there's no need for an external web route. So external web routes have to be explicitly granted such that access is under your control. So therefore you've got secure by default. You have to actually take action to allow the rest of the internet to be able to access these routes and you have full control of that. There's also the uh, support for uh, client-side certificates and support for JWT, for the JW tokens. We also have mechanism for ACLs. I would recommend having a look at our documentation. It's freely available online to see exactly how that works, but this allows you to do some simple security mechanisms right away and say, this service is only available in this situation and from this service and so on. And all of the services in Calix, because they're dealing via a proxy with the remainder of the Calix infrastructure, don't have direct access to the underlying data store. Therefore, it's actually much more difficult for any penetration to happen at the, uh, at the service level for something to be able to access your data. So there are, as with all good security programs, there's not just one big wall. There are many different layers of, of a good security program and it allows you to build applications in a zero trust mechanism. Oh, and of course, all data both at rest and in motion is continually encrypted. So the only time there's decrypted data is, of course, during the actual process. 
So some of the things to consider, again, around using these mechanisms for you to be able to develop a Calyx application that is secure is uh, local Docker execution, which you can do via CI CD pipeline um, if Docker, if running Docker locally is problematic. Because sometimes there will be security constraints in your organization that actually forbid local Docker execution. So that's an issue. Our command line utility, the Calyx CLI, is commercially licensed and must ideally be a develop, uh, available on your development machine. We have actually helped some clients use a web environment and a web IDE to be able to overcome constraints where they could not actually run that executable locally, um, or at least they could eventually, but it would take a long security validation process. <clears throat> so that CLI is an issue around uh, you know, making sure that you can develop locally. And then, of course, the Calyx-specific SDK. All of the different SDKs for each of the languages that Calyx uh, supports and the different frameworks it supports, because, for example, there's more than one SDK for Java, are open source and allow you essentially to more easily use the APIs of Calyx. <clears throat> they are not binary uh, SDKs in the sense that they don't connect in a binary fashion to Calyx. It's a network protocol. So although Calyx is running in the same uh, environment as your application, you're actually communicating it, communicating with it and all of its APIs via an internal network protocol. So from that point of view, there's an additional level of isolation there. So certain attacks are, are you know, not possible in that environment. Um, but each of these SDKs, of course, also goes through the same scrutiny that I described for Calyx development in general, that we consider them a part of Calyx and their uh, full, um, you know, uh, bill of materials, software bill of materials, their full supply chain is also validated and all of their dependencies validated. And of course, any contributions to those SDKs still go through our process. So even if one of our users contributes a new language support, for example, it still goes through our process before we will validate it. Uh, and as I mentioned, if local development is problematic, which it is in some highly secure environments and banks and financial institutions, then we have validated that Calyx will work and you can develop quite nicely with cloud IDs and be completely isolated from your own internal network if necessary. So you still have to, of course, build your applications with security in mind. It's entirely possible for you to build an application that would you know, allow some data to be publicly available and deploy it to Calyx. If that's your choice to make that data publicly available, you have to actually do it uh, intentionally, uh, because as I said, you have to add routes to your application. So keeping in mind all of the OWASP standards is still essential for your development team. Uh, we do have tooling, for example, that can check for common security issues. I mentioned uh, Fortify and the Scala plugin. There are many other language plugins for Fortify. Um, dependencies of your application must of course also be analyzed for vulnerabilities. So even though you're running in a very safe and secure environment, you could be using a dependency, log4j, anyone, that is known to have you know, a potential backdoor, and you need to be able to scan for that. So we do recommend the same kind of standards that we apply to developing Calyx itself need to be applied when you're building your applications to deploy on Calyx. And we do all of this internally for Calyx. And of course, dependencies also need to be checked for acceptable license terms for your use. Um, you know, some organizations don't permit GPL applications, for example. Okay, so some of the facilities that I talked about before, <clears throat> just to resummarize and talk about the how they fit with the encryption of data at rest and the data uh, the encryption of data in motion are the transport layer security, of course, communication with clients, access control list, which I mentioned. There's a link here for all of our documentation on this. The ability to do client certificates, if it's service-to-service -service communication you're looking for, that's a good way to ensure the, uh, the origin of requests. And of course, JSON web tokens, which are extremely popular with web applications. And then of course, on top of that, port limiting, such that no other ports could be used by you know, an external party to potentially attack your application. So these are, of course, in addition to the built-in encryption of data at rest and data emotion that I've mentioned a couple of times. So that doesn't require any effort on your part to have your data encrypted when it's actually stored with Calyx. Uh, we talked about routes. We talked about the fact that routes are not automatically created. This is actually a security feature in and of itself, because when you deploy a new service, you must explicitly say, here's the URL that can actually access that service. TLS is always required. Uh, Calyx can generate a cert for you. 
um, which is very convenient when you're first, start, first starting up and trying to deploy your first few services, or you can supply your own cert, of course, which typically you would want to do in a, a full deploy, in a production deploy. Uh, you can update, rotate your cert at any time. Client-side certificates, as I mentioned before, are supported. And there's, again, a detailed link to the documentation as to how to do all of these things. I'm just eyeballing the Q&A link there. Okay, I don't see anybody raising their hand so far. And uh, I'm trusting Hugh to stop me if my, if my satellite goes behind a cloud here. So let's talk for a moment about JWTs. So JWTs give you the ability to provide authorization and authentication for your service requests. We support both the symmetric and asymmetric keys, many different algorithms. Again, we can generate the key for you, which is very convenient getting started, or you can supply your own keys, and you can utilize multiple keys for one service if that's appropriate. So a single deployment unit in Calyx can have multiple endpoints, and those could be secured independently. The, the security doesn't have to apply all, all for the one and you know no exceptions for that one service. Um, we also support the, both the validation and signing of messages, and all of this can be validated locally. So this is one of the advantages of Calyx is you can actually run what we call a local proxy and validate all of your services before you ever even deploy into the cloud environment <clears throat> to make sure that you're getting the, you know, the results you expect. There's also a good blog post here, and again, we'll share these links, uh, that allows you to uh, see how JWT and Auth0 were integrated. So this is one of the experiments one of our team used. Client certificates is a great way, uh, again, often used in the situation where a service is calling another service. So some uh, external service is calling a backend Calyx service, perhaps some other application that is running locally or in your own private cloud. Um, this is more for course grain control. So this external party can in fact communicate with this entire service. Um, again, reuse an existing cert or use your use an entirely different certificate authority and routes can be individually assigned to require specific cert, uh, certs. So you can actually say, you know, these routes are available to this set of certs, these routes are available to that set of certs with configuration. And again, certificates can be rotated or replaced. I see a typo. <laughs> again, detailed documentation here uh, for all of the, how do you actually do that? And then ACLs, which we br you know brushed over very quickly before, control which services and sources of request may access your services. So service-to-service -service calls are automatically encrypted. So there's mutual TLS within the cluster of Calyx itself. And principles are defined, e.g. callers, and then allowed or denied to each service endpoint. So on an endpoint end by endpoint basis, you can control with ACLs access to each of your services. And we do encourage this. Now, it's entirely possible to bypass this and do your own security, but this gives you a convenient way to, to A, get started, and also do a high level of security if you're using other controls on top of this. We also just recently added the idea of a service token. The service token is associated with a project and allows the bearer to exchange the service token for an access token to actually get access to that project and therefore allows for the easy automation of things like CI CD pipelines. So for example, if your CI pipeline wants to actually deploy a new version of a service into Calyx, and you don't wanna to have to stop and have a human do that, well, they need some way to authenticate themselves against Calyx to say, hey, am I actually allowed to deploy a service? Generally, they would not be, of course. This gives you a mechanism if you choose to use it to say, all right, we actually do want to allow the CI CD process with the appropriate token to access our, uh, our deployment environment and deploy a new version of this service. And then of course, you can also set up multiple um, environments within your Calyx workspace to be able to differentiate between a development environment, a staging environment and a production environment and do the appropriate uh, upgrades or migration from each of those environments according to your own development standards. Also, I mentioned at this point, somewhat related interactive developer logins can also be uh, secured via multi-factor authentication something we've also just added fairly recent. Okay, that's actually the end of my formal presentation. Uh, that cooked through pretty quickly. Does anybody have questions? I am opening my Q&A tab right now. I'll stop sharing and I will await if anyone has some questions. You can you confirm yeah. for me that this thing- No, yeah, it went, everything went well. Okay. Um, 
Good job with that. It's great to have a, a, a much more comprehensive security offering now uh, than we've had before, especially mm -hmm. with Calix. So yeah, Lightman don't... realizes that, you know, from a point of view of a hosted service, security becomes front and center. And, you know, we're taking it extremely seriously, as you know. Yeah. Plus, it, I, I like from the standpoint of the, uh, for, for developers, you know, the, the things that we can do. And, and that was uh, actually, there's no uh, questions, but I, you know, I think you and I put together some questions that we could just kind of cover that we thought might be interesting. Um, well, and you know, one of the, you know one of the questions is what are some of the common use cases and and like I was just saying you know like common use cases from the perspective of developers um, implementing their services and exposing them out. You know, you mentioned uh, JWTs, uh, uh, JSON Web Tokens, right, and mm -hmm. and certificates um, mm -hmm. and ACLs. Um, is that really kind of the main thing that developers can do is to control security or? Well, there's really a couple of use cases in there. One of them, like I mentioned, client-side certs are very popular for service-to-service -service communication, where you want to say, okay, unless that other service is authenticating itself appropriately, then you know, deny access to my Calix service. Uh, whereas JWT is much more common for it can be used for you know service to service communication, but it's much more common when you're building like a single page web application, something of that nature. Uh, JWT in order to validate login or have a login procedure. And I see there's actually a, a, a question in the question and answer. End user auth would be handled outside. Unfortunately, it's the usual answer. It depends. Not necessarily outside in the sense that if you wanted to authenticate a user via, let's say, an SSO mechanism, and then pass in a token to say, okay, you know, JWT or something that says, all right, this user is this person with these authorizations, and therefore, they should be allowed to access services. That is certainly one way to do it. We've seen that happen. There's nothing stopping you writing a login mechanism. In fact, we've got a couple of samples of this within Calix itself. We actually can handle the back and forth and the flow, even of, uh, even of an SSO style authentication um, and user authorization by building Calyx services to do that. That's possible. So either, I guess this is the correct answer to your question. I hope that answered you. But the you know, ultimate authentication though would, would be external though, right? So to answer this specific question, which it's a great question that, I mean, we don't do any, do we do authentic authentication or do we depend on an external thing to do that? Well, we, we give you the tools to do authentication. Let's say that. So there is no mechanism. There's no like built-in login page that you can just use within Calix. Mm. You could build one by building appropriate Calix services. Um, and then by using the ACLs and using the JWT support, you could get that kind of authentication or you could do it entirely external to, uh, to Calix. For example, integration with a tool like Okta or one of the other SSO providers like Google. And then simply having the user authentication not happen at all within Calyx, then you just write your services. It depends really what you need in terms of an application. I would say in terms of how common is it to write something that's doing end user auth in Calyx, fairly uncommon. You know, you're right in that sense that it's usually easier, usually easier to do it external to the, uh, to the Calyx services. Cool. Okay. Just because there's some great tooling out there. And of course, we integrate very easily because, of course, being a cloud native environment, it's very straightforward to get things to go back and forth to Calyx services as required. Okay. Um, yeah. Another one that, and you kind of alluded to this, it's just how do we make sure that um, we can meet the, you know, that the customer can meet their compliance requirements? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, like, is there a document or documentation? And I, I know there's documentation on security, but mm -hmm. is there something say that um, the teams that are doing the development can give to their security organizations to show how their Calyx application is com you know, compliant? Yes, definitely. Yeah, compliance and security being slightly tangential in the sense that you need security, but at the same time from a, uh, from a compliance point of view and potentially even a legal point of view, for regulatory purposes, you need uh, compliance and you need to know that your vendor supply chain, including Flightbend, who would be one of your vendors in this, 
uh, situation is compliant with a set standard, with the appropriate standard for our country. And in the US, that's basically the SOC 2 standard. I say basically simply because it also incorporates things like GDPR, which we're also compliant with, and some elements of the ISO 27001 standard as well. <clears throat> what we have is a comprehensive set of documents that uh, define our policies. So often a, an internal uh, audit or an internal security group will want to see those. And you know, with a relationship with the customer, we can, of course, pass on the appropriate ones. It's a pretty beefy document, so we don't just sort of hand it over. But selectively, you know, organizations will want to see, particularly financial services organizations, will want to see you know, who is validating that we are, in fact, following our standards. So that would be the audit report that we're doing right now, where an external party says, OK, for these trust criteria within SOC 2, we will validate that Lightbend actually meets those criteria. Typically, that's a good starting point. Often, we will also participate in, we very frequently do, what's called a vendor questionnaire. Essentially, your security department will ask us a series, or usually we'll have a portal, whereby they can ask us a whole series of questions and provide proof and documentation, and in some cases, diagrams and other data to validate their concerns to go, okay, are we doing this? Are we handling physical security? Are we handling background checks? Are we doing, you know, they will have a whole series of questions that they need for their own internal assurance program. And that's part of what we do as when companies sign up with Calix, if we, if they need to go through that process, we'll facilitate it. Um, usually it's pretty quick. Sometimes it can be, you know, as many as weeks before we actually get through the whole process, but that's part and parcel of what we do. So how do they, how do, how do customers reach out to us to uh, begin that process? What's the typical way that they would connect to us? Yeah, the easiest way is to actually ask a question via our support mechanism in <clears throat> within Calix. So there are links within Calix that go to our online support. If you say, hey, I need to do a security questionnaire or I need to, you know, have answers uh, around compliance and, uh, and you know, my own internal compliance needs, uh, then we'll get back to you immediately that way. Or you can reach out to us via email. Okay, great. Yeah, it's not an unusual request. We're very happy to get those and very happy to handle them. Yeah, excellent. Next question was um, about you know, where's the data actually stored? Ah, you know, that's right. kind of an interesting story with Calyx, right? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. The The data is stored, eventually does end up in a database, even though you don't need to deal with a database as a customer of Calyx. And where that database physically is goes back to that discussion about data sovereignty. <clears throat> so it if you do not specify, then we will allocate you in a, an appropriate region based on where, you're, where you are as a customer, and you will be in a multi-tenant cluster, but in your own independent database. So the databases are always completely segregated. There's no opportunity or risk of you ever overlapping with someone else's data. <clears throat> if that's not sufficient for your own internal compliance, and sometimes it's not, or if you have specific data sovereignty needs, e.g. you have to have your data in Switzerland, for example, which was one request from one customer, um, not just the EU, but Switzerland specifically, then we need what we call a dedicated cluster. And this is a value add that allows us to say, okay, this cluster is set up in this data center or in this region of either AWS or GCP or Azure, again, your choice, in this particular place. And typically what they will do is have a multi-zone uh, region such that we have the redundancy where there are actually multiple data centers <clears throat> so that you know one data center fire can't take you offline kind of thing but then you have control over selecting where that region is going to be that allows you to say all right my data my backups all of my processing are happening at this specific place so you get to choose i guess is the answer to the question that i love okay all right well no more other questions. So I think uh, we could wrap it up here. Um, one last thing, though, is um, where is the best place to go and look at some of the, um, you know, the, the, you know, the security documentation? Aha, uh -huh. that would be the Calyx documentation. So if you go to calyx.io and then go to the documentation, there is a section under services called securing services. And we have a link in the presentation as well when we ship that out. And that securing services is the keyword you want to search for in the Calyx doc, and it will show you all of the sections that we just talked about. Yeah, and if you go to the Calyx homepage, like you said, Calyx.io, mm -hmm. there's um, 
a developer link at the top. You click the developer link and then right kind of in the middle of the developer page is that link to the documentation. So it's kind of Calyx IO developer documentation and then services and securing services, which is in the left panel uh, exactly. of that, of that page. That's the path. That's the one. All right. Always if you like to answer the question at the time, then please do drop us a line afterwards. Yeah, definitely. And really appreciate, uh, again, I always learn a little bit more every time I hear you do this presentation, but about two or three times, I, I just love the story because I feel like we're covered, you know, finally you know, that we've got it covered end to end. That's uh, certainly which is the plan. A nice place to be. Yeah, mm -hmm. excellent. Indeed. Thanks a lot, Mike. Well, thank you. And thanks everybody for coming.